We're in the 23rd lesson of the book of Judges, and I want you to pick up your Bibles and turn and open to um, chapter 11. Have that open there so that when we get to it now, like we've done the last, the last couple of lessons, we've ended kind of in a spot where we uh, couldn't, couldn't complete all of our thoughts. And as you remember in the end of last week's lesson, uh, we were at the point where we had a problem with the timing and the timeline. And the problem was that we had learned that uh, Abimelech, uh, Tola, and Jair were just minor judges, and, and they were not called by the Lord to be the deliverer of Israel. Israel. Uh, Abimelech was an evil ruler for three years in basically his mother's little townships that he, her, her family lived in around Shechem. We learned that Tola was the uh, judge over an area uh, where a prison was. He, so he was a judge of a prison area, town. And we learned that Jair... Uh, was over in the area of Gilead. And the problem is, is when you add those times, that's as many as 47 years, that took us to 319 years in the timeline. But Jephthah has just told us in the last passage that we read that only 300 years had passed. So we were 19 years too long. So we discussed, if we go back and take out the time of Abimelech and Tola and Jair, that leaves us with 271 years, coming up to the point of Jephthah being called to be a le the leader and the chief in this fifth cycle of sin. Well, with that, we've got time. And in fact, when you figure it up, we've got about six years, because we're, we've got five cycles, it's 29 years, 29, 30 years, we've got about six years because we were asking the question how long did the Lord allow Israel to sin by worshiping Baal and Ashtaroth before he sent the oppressors and it's always a question mark for us but right now because we're at that we've got this 30 year 29 30 year mark we can say this uh, we can go back and look back into the heritage and history of what has, was instructed through Moses and come up with the, the idea, look, it's been five cycles. There's been five times of sin that has caused the Lord to send oppressors. Five times in 29, 30 years. Well, you divide that up, that's six years. What can we look back at the Lord's instruction in the history and realize how long does the Lord wait before He acts sometimes? Well, in the case of Israel, with their worship of false gods and graven images, the instruction was very plain. You see, before Moses died, back in the Deuteronomy, the nation, the nation of Israel was instructed to do something, if you remember, and they heard it. They were instructed to read the covenant and to read the laws and the commandments every seventh year, what for? As a reminder, so the nation of Israel would not forget its relationship with the Lord. And we find that in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 10 through 13. Now, if you want to turn over there, hold your finger in where you are in Judges chapter 11, and turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 31. And it reads as follows. Verse number 10 in Deuteronomy chapter 31. Then Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the time of the year of the release of the debts, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place which he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel so that they hear it. Assemble the people, the men, the women, the children, and the stranger who is in your town, so that they may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God, and be careful to follow all the words of this law. And their children who have not known will hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. As long as you live on the land which you are about to cross the Jordan to possess. Deuteronomy 31, 10 through 13. Therefore, when the nation of Israel sinned against the Lord, the scripture reading to everyone in the nation would warn the people who worshipped Baal and Ashtaroth that they were without excuse. 
and they were out of the will and the covenant of the Lord. In short, the Lord would only need to wait until the seventh year when the law was read to give the people time to repent and to destroy their idols and to stop their idol worship. When they did not, he sent the oppressors. Then the Ammonites, if you remember from our past passage, after they heard what Jephthah said to them, disregarded the message with Jephthah's sent. The time of the rebellion was up. The 18 years was up and it was time for Jephthah. They disregarded it because their accusations was a fabricated lie, a flimsy excuse for why they were oppressing Israel. Oppression meant tax re revenues. The Ammonites surely did not care about the land of Reuben or they would have been in that land fighting to take it. But it never belonged to the sons of Ammon in the first place. With his message disregarded, we come to the reaction to, to Ammon's complaint. And the Lord moved upon Jephthah. And Jephthah was chosen by the Lord. And Jephthah advanced to meet the sons of Ammon. And we see that here in chapter 11. Look down into verse 29 and read along with me. Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah so that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh. Then he passed through Mitzvah of Gilead. And from Mitzvah of Gilead he went on to the sons of Ammon. Most scholars focus on the writer's words. He passed through Gilead and Manasseh. And they focus on that to mean that Jephthah passed through the land of Gilead to gather troops and support. And then he crossed to the west side of the Jordan River to do the same in Manasseh's land. But I disagree. Those scholars are reading into the scripture something that is not there and failing to consider what has already been said and the scene's geography. First of all, back in chapter 10, verse 27, we learned that the sons of Israel gathered together and camped in Mitzvah. All the warriors in Israel who wanted to fight and all those who wanted to support Jephthah, all they, everybody that was needed was already located in Mitzvah. They were already there. Jephthah did not have to go out through the land at all. They had been summoned before Jephthah was selected. He did not need to garner support for the tribe of Manasseh living on the west side of the Jordan River because they were already in Mitzvah. Second, the writer has simply given us the ge geography of the area. Jephthah was in Gilead in the land of Manasseh in Mitzvah. From Mitzvah, with the army of Israel, Jephthah moved to the camp of Ammon, which was also in Gilead. Simply, in our Western English mind, we would have written it like this, in my wording. Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Mitzvah to Gilead, in the area of Manasseh, to the camp of Ammon nearby. But as we will see in the following passage, the camp of Ammon was extensive. It was huge. During their years of oppression of Israel, Ammon had taken over and camped in 20 cities over a distance from the Arir River to Abel Karaman. Now we do not know the location of Abel Karaman. Therefore, we do not know the extent of Ammon's control in miles. We just do not know, have no idea. Now before going to battle with the sons of Ammon, Jephthah made time with the Lord. We do the same thing, you know. We, when we face struggles for which we do not know the outcome. But Jephthah made a vow to the Lord in his time with the Lord. It was a vow that would turn out to be foolish in the end. Verse number 30. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, 
if you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He struck them with a very great slaughter from Ar to the entrance of Minioth, twenty cities, and as far as Abel Kuraman. So the sons of Ammon were subdued before the sons of Israel. The Lord granted Jephthah the victory over the Ammonites. Was there any doubt? You see, the Lord would always move ahead of His chosen judges and fight for them in battles. And after all, Jephthah was chosen by the Lord. But what about this vow? You see, Jephthah said, Whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Now the Lord is serious about vows. He's also serious about oaths. Let us look at some of the verses that tell us the seriousness of a vow or an oath. First from Leviticus chapter 5 verse 4. Or if a person swears thoughtlessly with his lips to do evil or to do good, in whatever matter a man may speak thoughtlessly with an oath, and it is hidden from him, and then he comes to know it, he will be guilty in one of these. Now from the book of Numbers, just verse number 2. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Now to Deuteronomy verse chapter 23, verse 21. When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it would be sin to you. And the Lord your God will surely require it of you. However, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be sin to you. You shall be careful to perform what goes out from your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. Three books address the seriousness of a vow or an oath made to the Lord. A vow is a solemn promise made to God to perform something or to abstain from something. Now an oath is a formal promise that binds an individual to do as pledged under the threat of some penalty. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord on that day to offer the Lord to the Lord as a burnt offering the first thing that came out of his house if the Lord would allow him to defeat the sons of Ammon. Indeed, the Lord allowed Jephthah to defeat the sons of Ammon. Now Jephthah was headed home to see what came out of his house. From the vow of Jephthah, we come to the promise of Jephthah, for he never expected what was going to happen next. Verse number 34. Listen to the story in its fullness. When Jephthah came to his house at Mitzvah, behold, his daughter was coming out to meet him with tambourines and with dancing. Now she was his one and only child. Besides her, he had no son or daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you are among those who trouble me. For I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. So she said to him, My father, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me as you have said, since the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the sons of Ammon. She said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go to the mountains and weep because of my virginity, I and my companions. Then he said, Go. 
So he sent her away for two months. And she left with her companions and wept on the mountains because of her virginity. At the end of the two months, she returned to her father, who did to her according to the vow which he had made, and she had no relations with a man. Thus it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. I wish from every point of the core of my being that I could find a way to explain this passage adequately, but I cannot. I wish that I could say that Jephthah did not keep his vow to the Lord, but I cannot. Why? Because the writer tells us that he did to her according to the vow which he made. Words are words. They have meaning. I cannot for the life of me find a way to say that Jephthah found a way to keep from offering his daughter as a burnt offering. I cannot. Some preachers say that Jephthah did not offer her as a burnt offering because that would be abomination to the Lord. Instead, he forbade her from having relationship with a man and therefore she remained a virgin for the rest of her life. How do you come to that point? The preachers focus on the last part of the line instead of the first part as the two together say, who did to her according to the vow which he made, and she had no relations with a man. But the writer has already told us that she was a virgin in verse number 37. Two months later, when she came back to her father to complete his vow, she was still a virgin. The last phrase in the sentence of verse 39 simply confirms that which has already been stated. It means that Jephthah had no more sons and daughters after her. Perhaps it was his punishment for a hasty vow to the Lord that the Lord required him to keep. I rarely use the works of Matthew Henry's concise commentary at all in my writings, but I think he makes several excellent points here. Matthew Henry speaks of lessons to be learned from this passage. And he says the following. First, number one, there may be reminders of distrust and doubting even in the hearts of true and great believers. Number two, our vows to God should not be as a purchase of a favor we desire, but to express gratitude to Him. Number three, we need to be very well advised in making vows, lest we entangle ourselves. Number four, what we have solemnly vowed to God we must perform, if it is possible and lawful, though it be difficult and grievous to us. And so we end this dreadful passage with this thought found in the scripture. We read it a few minutes ago. Let us read it again. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out from his mouth. The man of God must be careful in what he says to the Lord. The nation of Israel was out from underneath the oppression of Ammon because of Jephthah. He was also the new chief of the people of Gilead on the east side of the Jordan River. The oppression was stopped because of the elders of Gilead who reached out to Jephthah to rid the whole nation of Israel of the oppression of Ammon and Ammon was dealt with. But the elders of Gilead did not have the full approval of all the tribes of Israel. That point is proven by the rejection of Jephthah by Ephraim's accusation. And then we find Ephraim all stirred up again here in chapter 12 and verse number 1. And the men of Ephraim were summoned and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Japheth, Why did you cross over to fight against the sons of Ammon without calling us to go with you? We will burn your house down on you. 
evidently the chief of Ephraim summoned all its elders to make a journey to visit uh, Jephthah in his hometown of Zaphon with the complaint and the accusation that the tribe of Ephraim had once again been left out of the decision-making process and thwarted of the opportunity to participate in the salvation of the nation from its oppressor, Ammon. Now at least two months had passed since the defeat of the Ammonites because of what happened with Jephthah's daughter. And the Gilead forces had been dispersed back to their homes. They were no longer. All Ammon was taken care of. The troops were gone back to their homes. So the men of Ephraim wanted to know why they were omitted. Obviously they had heard from the troops that had returned home. And they were there to threaten Jephthah. Undoubtedly, Ephraim had not forgotten the bad blood that it had with Gideon, not the Gileadites, but Gideon, the judge. They had bad blood with Gideon previously. And this was a reaction that had festered through the years of Gideon's reign. But we must ask uh, Ephraim this question. Why did Ephraim's warriors not join the others from Israel over in Mitzvah when they were summoned to go out and fight against Ammon before the selection of Jephthah? They had probably not taken up the challenge. But when Jephthah came, they want to know why he hadn't asked it. Well, with the men at his home, we hear Jephthah's reaction. Chapter 12, verse 2. Jephthah said to them, I and my people were at great strife with the sons of Ammon. When I called you, you did not deliver me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not deliver me, I took my life in my hands and crossed over against the sons of Ammon. And the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought Ephraim. And the men of Gilead defeated Ephraim because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, O Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and in the midst of Manasseh. Had Jephthah reached out to the tribe of Ephraim and Ephraim not responded? Did Jephthah reach out personally? Or did the Gileadites reach out previous to Jephthah's being selected? The clue is found in Jephthah's words here. He says, I and my people were at great strife for the sons of Ammon. And when I called you, you did not deliver me from their hands. And when I saw you would not deliver me, I took my life in my hands and crossed over against the sons of Ammon. And the Lord gave them into my hands. We must take this passage at face value and accept it for what it says. Jephthah must have reached out to the tribe of the Ephraim and no response from Ephraim. Therefore, Jephthah proceeded without them. No other explanation can clear up this scenario. Evidently, the elders had to return to the tribal area of Ephraim to gather their forces, which gave Jephthah time to gather Gilead's forces to defeat Ephraim. Well, with that, the last statement the Ephraimite might said in this passage was this. You are fugitives of Ephraim, O Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim, in the midst of Manasseh. When they say, that it is an internal proof statement that we addressed in Judges chapter 7 verse 3. If you remember, the land on the east side of the Jordan River was given by Moses to half the tribe of Manasseh. And the nickname for that area was called Gilead. Joshua gave the other half tribe of Manasseh the land on the west side of the Jordan River and nicknamed it Makor. And if you remember, as we have stated many times, Gilead was the son of Makor. Also, Gilead had many descendants within its family clans. It may have been the most populated line of the descendants of Makor. And in Judges chapter 7, verse 3, Gideon was at the valley of Jezreel culling down the number of troops that would go and fight the Midianites with him that night. And he said to the 32,000 troops, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. How could that be? The land of Gilead was on the other side of the Jordan River. In fact, 
Gideon was standing on Mount Gilbo, not Gideon, not Mount Gideon. So did Gideon misspeak? Did the writer miswrite? No. Mount Gilbo stands in the tribal area of Manasseh. Stated in the commentary in Judges 7 and verse 3, I said this, Descendants of Gilead lived on both sides of the Jordan River. Therefore, in Gibeon's camp, there were Gileadites from the east side and from the west. And the camp of Gideon was first and foremost the camp of the commander of Manasseh, Gideon. He and his tribal kin were supported by men from Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, but it was no less the camp of Manasseh in origin with Gideon at the lead. Therefore, the nickname of Gilead was fully appropriate for the camp under Gideon's command. And as we have studied in the past, it was very common for geographical locations to have more than one name or nickname. And the case is the same here. Gideon was camped on Mount Gilboa, but, became, but because it was his camp, the camp of the warriors of Manasseh, Gideon nicknamed it Mount Gilead. Thus, those who were afraid and trembling were to leave the camp of Gideon and the camp of Mount Gilead. Now let's focus on the words that say this, in the midst of Ephraim and in the midst of Manasseh. Oh, I would love to focus on those words. But folks, we need to focus on those words and finish this story the next time we come together to study about what Japheth is going to do with these Ephraimites. And we'll do that in lesson number 24 in the book of Judges.